And we're live. Uh, welcome, everyone. We are virtually connecting from the uh, OER 17 uh, conference. Uh, I'm uh, Nadina Bulmag, the virtual buddy for today's session. And uh, Simon, who will introduce himself later on, is the co virtual buddy. Um, I'm going to pass it on to on site folks. Uh, we're connecting with on site buddy Teresa. And uh, our on-site guests are Lorna uh, Campbell, Martin Huxley, and John Robertson. So uh, why don't you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about the conference. This is, you just finished, this is the end of day, uh, uh, connecting session. You guys just finished an amazing day full of so much. So we want to hear all about it. Yeah, Nadine, we've had a really, good, really busy day and it's just day one. There's loads more to come. So we're kind of... Still taking everything in. I'm going to ask everybody just to introduce themselves to you. So can we start with them? Okay, so tell me if you can hear me. Uh, my name is John Robertson. I'm an instruction designer. Uh, I'm based currently these days in Oregon State University, out in Cabalas in the West Coast of the States. Uh, hi there, my name is Lorna Campbell. I work at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland and I used to work with <laughs> these guys at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. So we go way back. <laughs> My name's uh, Martin Hoxie. I work for the Association for Learning Technology, which helps put on OER 17, as Lorna said. Lorna used to be my boss, <laughs> and I stole John's job. But <laughs> <That> only <laughs> so because he left to go to the U. <laughs> oh, the power dynamics is just going bonkers here. So I'm Warwick Language. I've worked for some years with Simon Enser, who is your other virtual buddy on there. Um, it's virtually connecting uh, students for language learning. And, and now I understand why this trio works so well. Because <laughs> Lorna actually was another virtually connecting, um, interviewing at uh, Alt C. Yeah, I've done a few, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Alt Hand at virtually connecting. So we've had a really busy day. Would you like to hear the sorts of things we've been finding out about and exploring? Absolutely. Tell us all about it. I mean, like I said, this is the uh, end of day session, so we want to hear all about the day. Go for it. What, what impressions, guys, have you had oh. all day? And what's I've been sleeping story? all day, so um, <laughs> I kind of. I, I was involved in um, two. I did a panel this morning on um, OER and open education in the uh, era of Trump and, Bre and Brexit. So that was very much focusing on the political. So that that was very timely, um, and but it worked really well. We had. Um, uh, videos from off-site participants, we had a lot of discussion in the room. Um, so I think that kind of, the, the political theme is very, very obvious. It's not an undercurrent, it's right front and centre in most of the sessions. Um, the other um, paper I was doing today was one on um, policy development in the UK since the Cape Town Declaration 10 years ago, and basically how little progress we've made in terms of government open education policy, although there's lots of stuff going on at the institutional level. Um, so yeah, certainly, I mean, I, I kind of feel like I haven't quite caught up with most of the rest of the, the conference yet. Um, two keynotes were awesome. I mean, Maha's keynote was fabulous, and um, closing keynote there was just brilliant, Diana Archie. Um, but yeah, the, the, the political is, is very obvious. It's, it's very clear. Uh, I think I've been impressed by kind of the sheer variety of uh, sessions that have, have been going on. I think that one of the things that struck me as a theme is very much that being open doesn't relate just to licensing, um, which is you know, kind of obvious in some ways, but it's also that, you know, uh, what struck me many sessions that there was this theme about ownership, and like sometimes being open means uh, not doing things in public, and sometimes being you know, being open and including people means that you retain all rights. Uh, so that was sh showed up a little bit in the keynote this morning, but then also there was a, uh, a conversation about uh, uh, Tanya um, Dorsey Elias, I think, from um, uh, uh, Thomas Rivers uh, in Kamloops, um, was talking about uh, a resource she'd set up to help uh, people who were victims of abuse share their story. Um, it was you know, a very, it was a very open practice focused on the kind of the, there was a gathering uh, process to that that kind of gave those stories uh, kind of context and meaning and voice. But one of the things that she realised partway through the process is that unless they were actively choosing uh, to make those open, putting an open license on them was, was counterproductive. So mm. 
that, that story was the only thing that they had ownership of. Mm -hmm. So to, to promote that open practice, it was you know, copyright, all rights reserved. Uh, you can't do anything with this unless I give you permission. Mm -hmm. That was an interesting balance. I think I think that's come through in some of the other sessions as well. This idea that openness has got to be a choice. You have to have the right to choose openness because otherwise, if it's imposed on you from from outside, then it's not open. It's something different. It's coercion, some kind. Mm -hmm. I, it was really interesting the the activism angle as well. Mm -hmm. um, Nicole Allen from Spark actually gave a really good talk um, about how um, basically guidance about how you, you know you can get the message out how mm -hmm. you know the things that you should be considering you know the threats as well in terms of um, open washing and how you can uh, combat that also I have to say there was a session by John Casey which I was completely enthralled with and uh, in part because he mentioned paradata oh. and uh, <laughs> The nerd in you had to be there. <laughs> Which, it makes us smile because we are all former employees of um, a, a Centre of Interoperability Standards and Power yes. Data. This is it's a lovely, right. lovely yeah. thing. It is. Um, it is. The world needs so, more power data. Yeah. So I was not <laughs> expecting that um, coming to the conference this year, but I, I got my power data for three. <laughs> Wow, that's another new buzzword. <laughs> I think one of the other things that struck me is that like, I mean, I've been coming to the OER conference forever since they started in 2012 in Cambridge. I've been to all of them. This is, this is my conference, it's one I come to every year. Um, and it's become more and more and more international um, every year. Uh, and that's, I mean, I, I suppose it is kind of a, a deliberate policy now, but it just kind of happened. Um, and it's been really nice to see so much international participation this year uh, and to hear like really great stories about work that's going on all over the world. Um, there was a brilliant presentation from uh, a guy from Lebanon talking about the use of OER with students and what was really interesting about that was he'd actually done a lot of research with the students who had used the resources um, and had figures on um, you know how to improve their learning, their perception of it, you know he'd actually done and quantitative research on this, and that was really good. And I was hearing great things about Uruguay from another room as well. I missed that presentation. <laughs> yeah, I have to say it's very it's very international. The, yeah. the, the presentations that we've got um, in OER seventeen are, are very international. And and I've got to put a word in for the workshop that I chaired. Actually, I didn't mm. sort of I was just happened to be there as a chair and got so involved and wrapped up in it that I almost forgot my cards to show you. you know, <laughs> Ten minutes we're going to wind up. Um, that was uh, well, Car Caroline uh, Kern and uh, Catherine Cronin played a great trick on us, splitting us into groups, um, sharing some practitioner research that they've collected um, into attitudes towards using OER. Uh, and asked us to sort of read the read the quotes and then decide who was making these quotes. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that you know half the group had quotes from students, half of them actually had quotes from practitioners. And actually, we had all assumed that the quotes that were mm -hmm. largely negative about their sort of confidence to use uh, the digital um, were from old, resistant, academic staff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was really interesting that, you know, not knowing that before we started that helped us reframe our internal dialogues about who can do what. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and the fact that actually we as a community sometimes have disempowered young people because we've told them how scary it is to, to be online. And in that process, they have become disenfranchised. Therefore, they don't feel they have the tools that they need to behave appropriately and uh, effectively online. Uh, that was a, a, a pure joy and delight to be part of that workshop earlier this afternoon. Mm -hmm. And that, that's interesting. So I think that ties in as well with it, what our, our colleague from the Lebanon was saying, that um, the students responded very favorably to the use of OER um, and they perceived that it had helped their learning. They, they, the, the feedback was really positive. When they when they surveyed the faculty, they were much less 
positive about the use and they thought it was going to impact negatively on the students' learning and that the students would not appreciate it. So there was there was definitely a sort of difference of opinion there. So, uh, so it's just There's really lots to, to do in that area. Mm -hmm. I mean, the interesting thing is, that although with the OER, OER conference, it, it's we, we, the discussions are moving from resource to practice and and that's really important because resources if they're not being used if they're not being incorporated in practice are simply sitting on shelves they may be digital shelves but they're not doing a great yeah deal. although i would disagree with that slightly and i think it's i think if we're shifting the focus to practice, we have to be very careful that we don't actually neglect the no, fact that we no, haven't I totally agree. solved no, the I totally issue where we are in that no. there, we haven't got public licences on publicly funded educational resources. And I think I think there's a lot more awareness of that. And I think that maybe a few years ago there was a bit of a drift to say that, okay, we've done away on that sort of like wait wait it's not it's absolutely not we still need to lobby government we still need to make sure that if we're paying public money for resources they are available and yes we need the practice to use them as well but yeah. i think it's important not to lose sight that there's, uh, there's still a battle to be won there. no i think that's true and, and that establishing that principle was one of the most important mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. most significant uh, contributions of the of the oer community really wasn't mm -hmm. it so mm -hmm. that's that that is very important but we live in an era unfortunately where probably the funding for those sort of creative enterprises may not be there anymore or it may you know it, it may be challenged so well, i think the, the thing is the funding hasn't been there for a long long it's, time it's the funding dried up a long long yeah, time ago. Dried, but yeah. we still need to do the lobbying it's not for funding mm -hmm. it's for policy so okay. you need you need to get the government to put the policy in place in order to make it happen it's not necessarily about um foundation funding or grant funding i think it's it's got to be a policy change which is a slightly different different approach to it, i think but have we got any questions from the people who are listening in from um, I really like the idea that you guys are talking about the shifting um, from um, from resources to practice and then uh, back again and um, mm -hmm. keep um, shifting it. And I uh, also like the uh, idea earlier that uh, I think it was Maha that uh, brought it up when she was talking about the focus of um, process versus outcome. And I think that was uh, that was pretty interesting. And it's a very good dimension, an interesting dimension of. OER is, and I just wanted to see, um, um, that, that was just a comment, not a question, uh, but I, I also wanted to open it up for the rest of virtual folks. I just realized that we didn't do, or I forgot to do virtual uh, introductions, so whoever's going to go ahead with a comment or a question from the virtual folks, please introduce yourselves first. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I'll go first, possibly. Uh, again, is my audio okay? It's a little choppy. Hey, uh, Graeme Steele from my Glasgow Scotland. Uh, I'm a sort of open science machine, as some people say. And I uh, just say hello to uh, Marston and uh, Laura, who I've not seen in person for quite some time. Graham, I'm sorry, the, um, the audio is a little choppy. Can you uh, can you try adjusting the mic a little bit? Or maybe it's just me. Is it just me or is everybody else? No, it's, fine. It's, it's breaking up here too. Or, okay. or, type, or type your comments into the chat box. Yeah, Graham, you can go ahead and type it in and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it. Uh, Dina, who was uh, connecting from Ghana earlier, uh, she was talking about openness allowing for collaboration and knowledge sharing. And uh, later on, um, Simon and Justin had a conversation about uh, open as a state of mind. So Simon or Justin, do you guys want to unpack that and tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, Justin here from New Jersey, United States, um, physical education and health teacher. Yeah, my, my thought was a little around when you were talking about how the students were all about open. It seems like my students share everything almost to the point of oversharing everything and anything, whether it's physical or words, emotions, anything. So it seems like OER would be right up their alley to just, mm -hmm. you know, here's resources, share them out. They don't understand copyright. They don't care about copyright. They don't care about anything other than, hey, I read this really cool book or whatever. Let's share it out. So it seems like it would be natural for them. And I can understand why a faculty or a student would, would be a little reticent because of copyright, because maybe they've published something, maybe someone's stolen their ideas and try mm -hmm. to uh, take them as their own. So just Simon and I were talking about how that just seemed to be uh, feed right into the idea that kids are much more about OER than 
perhaps adults might be. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think often they don't have the language, but yeah. it's like the philosophy is already there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. That they, you know, I suppose the exposure, you know, to, you know, the internet opens up so many possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, and I don't know, I get, I, I, you know, when you start introducing things like copyright licenses and all that sort of stuff, my fear is it puts people off. Yeah, it does, it does. But but there are ways to introduce it. Yeah. My, um, one of the, my other colleagues from Edinburgh who's here at the conference is uh, Charlie Farley. And she works for the OER service in Edinburgh. And one of the things she does is uh, a workshop called Board Game Jam, where people have to design a board game. And it's, act, what it's actually about is copyright. It's teaching people about copyright. Mm. But she never sells it as that. She never advertises it as that. It's about come along and build a board game. That's exactly and what Jane Zecker was talking about yeah, in her talk uh, about lecture recording. Yeah, uh, in the process, yeah. people learn about copyright and how they can use yeah. images. And it's been hugely popular in Edinburgh. She did a workshop here this morning, um, which I think went quite well as well. So, so I absolutely agree, you know, that you, you don't go right in there and say, right, I'm going to teach you about copyright. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there are ways to introduce the concept of ownership and sharing and licensing, I think, without scaring people mm -hmm. off. And that's a really important discussion to have yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That is Super interesting. I am. Um, I'm really interested to hear about that because we also give um, a workshop um, to our. Um, okay, so we give this blended learning certificate program for uh, professors who decide to go blended, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the uh, one of the workshops we give them is about uh, open education resources, uh, copyright, and Creative Commons licenses, and um, mm -hmm. they usually are really interested and and they want to hear all about it. But I agree with Martin is that it sort of uh, puts them off a little bit or creates this, I don't know, vibe in the room that is like, oh, you're just telling us not to use stuff that we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that would be so interesting to hear about it. I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna tweet to you later on so you can... Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Be in touch with Charlie. She's great. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, uh, Jane Secker, who gave that session mm -hmm. today, she also spoke at the mm -hmm. annual conference. She gave a which brilliant was, keynote. Which yeah, recorded. Yeah, and I think worth looking at that when, keynote. I think... You know, the way she talked about it was about empowering you. Yeah, actually. very much so. Uh, but you know, the language can be quite a barrier sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, but you can, it's not mis-selling, it's kind of finding yeah. the, the different avenue in to, yeah. to yeah. get people interested. Yeah. I think one other, to Cheslo, from kind of what I'm doing currently, uh, one other thing is, you know, we develop online courses. Um, and one of the challenges for faculty is, you know, if we're putting something up online, if we're publishing it as part of the course, it's like, well, we need to write some permissions mm -hmm. for everything we're putting up. And I think one of the things that's really nice is uh, seeing the look of relief uh, on an instructor's face whenever you tell them, you know, okay, well, you know, we can help you get permissions for some of the things that you need to work on, uh, you know, that you, you need to have in your course. But for all these other things that you want to put in, um, we can help you find open licenses or open licensed images. We can help you find, we don't put it that way, but we can help you find what images you can, you can use. Yeah. You know, if you want to have this illustration in your lectures, we, we can help you with that. And it's introducing, like, you know, Flickr, Creative Commons searching and other things like that, just very simply and in terms of helping them uh, create courses, mm -hmm. learning experiences. Yeah. Kind of threshold concept. Yeah, uh, yeah. Had a uh -huh. Very interesting. It needs to be part of yeah. professional practice. It needs to be, you know, mm -hmm. we can't, we can't stop. We can't keep sort of molly coddling yeah. mm -hmm. academics and, and stuff. I was, I, was, I was talking to. Uh, I have a taxi driver I regularly use, and he does <laughs> he does tours. Um, uh -huh. So he does. Um, I can't remember the Scottish program that gets recorded. Um, but anyway, he does tours, and so he wanted to create a website. And he said, you know, it's just that you know, he wanted to steal his competitors' images. And I said, no, just go on to Flickr. Go. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to do it. One of the advanced options. Look for something called Creative Commons, and you'll find material um, that you can use for your website, and you don't have to worry about it. And it just opened up a whole new avenue. And was he surprised by that? Um. I, he was it? certainly very interested, right. and okay. he mentioned it the next time I saw him. Ah, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting that he asked to take his uh, competitors' pictures and not just generic pictures yeah. of, uh, on Google or any other website. Yeah. Uh, and it, it just shows how, um, how he wants to put himself or market himself somewhere 
out mm -hmm. there and how he wants his digital identity to be, uh, mm -hmm. which is a competitor to this person that yeah. he wants to get these pictures from. And it also beckons the question of uniqueness of your digital identity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I wonder. People are just known, some people are very, very well known about their open practice, right? That's the first thing you glean from when you get into uh, get into their profile, Twitter profile or their blogs mm -hmm. or anything. So that that kind of those kinds of angles and and layers sort of appear very easily and clearly on these digital identities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So uh, again, I, sorry, go for sorry, it. Sorry, that's something we talked about this morning as well. This this all different digital. I know we were talking about it on Twitter these different digital identities mm. and how they impact and how you compartmentalize them. And that there's so much stuff in there and the whole digital footprint thing as well. So, but that's why resident. Yeah, I have to get started. <laughs> <laughs> we'd be here on midnight if we start talking about that. <laughs> and that's another, a whole other conversation on its own uh, as well. Yeah. I just wanted to let you guys know that we're now um, at, okay, so seven, my, seven o'clock my time, six o'clock uh, yeah. in, in London. I know it's the end of the, uh, of the day and I know it's the last session of the conference. You guys um, are pretty tired. So whatever you want to do do you want to stick around for a little bit maybe for a couple more questions from virtual folks or do you want to feel free to head out if you if you'd like we're scheduled to end at six yeah, we can okay. take a couple we'll take questions. a couple of virtual of questions thanks yeah so uh, you know, um, the go. conference is back tomorrow so yeah. yes yes more tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> hi i have a question it's jenny i'm in ontario canada i'm an instructional designer Nice. I follow many of you, so I know you. Uh, I'm part of the GoGN network, um, and spent time in in Cape Town with um, some amazing researchers, including Bea and uh, Martin uh, Nats. <laughs> All of whom were having very high level theoretical conversations way over my head, but it was really amazing experience. I'm much more of an applied practitioner and I am looking to, my research is on open educational practices in the context of online higher education learning and tuition based education. So open education, but within the accredited spectrum, which I think is, you know, is getting to the heart of awareness and spreading you know, good use of OER. What I'm hoping to do with my research actually is to um, empower learners and trust learners and partner with faculty members to do that so that they can find and share their own resources peer to peer for their own learning uh, and teaching them discernment and accessibility, how to design inclusively if you share or adapt a resource, how to find good quality from bad quality, um, and copyright, so licensing, all of that kind of combined with whatever discipline course they're trying to take in the same moment. So I'm just wondering if you have experience of um, of seeing learners do that, partnering with learners in that age spectrum. So here we're undergraduates, you know, 18 to 24 year olds, give or take. Um, how do you think they're responding to this idea of empowerment? Have you got any experience? Not more years? Not obviously you know, the you know, the people who are seem most to be doing that are doing that in the um, physical class from when you're like Robin Drosa and Rajiv in, in Canada. I think it's one of the questions that um, I'm, I'm speaking about tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm talking a little bit about the, you know, if you're designing, open, if you're designing uh, online hybrid courses, you know, it, how do you both pay attention to your know, quality standards that help you think about, you know, what questions do you have? What questions do you need to assess? And what do you also learn from open pedagogy in terms of how do you bring that student agency into the process? Uh, without wanting to give away too many secrets, there are two, two, two kind of really nice examples with you know instructors um, who I worked with uh, in the past couple of quarters. Um, one of them, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Smith. Uh, it's the end uh, of the day. So it's a, a history professor. Uh, and she was running a history seminar course, you know, original research paper course. And I was thinking about how do you take that process very much built around, you know, working with students to select a research topic and, and guide them through the process and create an online environment for that. And in that situation, what we ended up doing was very much building uh, a structure for the students to create a structure. Mm -hmm. That kind of uh, 
meta scaffolding, scaffolding for scaffolding. Me meta scaffolding. That was one approach. And another approach was, you know, again, in an online course was a, a rangeland course where the instructor really wanted um, students to have, be able to take the course content, but also apply it to their own discipline, apply it to, you know, students from across a range a spectrum of spectrum disciplines. So she kind of set it up with, you know, 10 week, a 10 week course. The first two or three weeks were kind of core concepts. And then she started building out um, different modules. Um, so students could kind of choose their own adventure through those modules and had to do so many modules. Now, mm -hmm. neither of those are particularly um, open in terms of open resources. Um, but in terms of open pedagogy and open process, I think that's, that's maybe part of the way that you can begin to think about creating an online course in that area. It's like either how do you create the scaffolding or how do you create a system that can expand the scale to allow choice. Yeah. But there's a lovely example from the University of Edinburgh as well in the Geosciences Department, mm -hmm. uh, it's, which is not something I'm involved in, but um, I, I spoke about it recently because it's, it's such a lovely example. It's, uh, so it's it's actually face -to a face-to-face -face course. Um, the, it's a fourth year course, it's optional, and it's outreach and engagement. And what the students have to do is they have to create, they have to work with an external partner to communicate a concept from any branch of geoscience. It could be sort of geology, it could be archaeology, it could be earth sciences, but an external audience. And, um, but the students get to create their own project the university will team them up with external partners where they can find their own. Um, again, their teacher might suggest a project. They're encouraged to develop their own. And uh, the student works closely with the external partner to develop what could be a learning resource or a workshop or a poster or a leaflet, all kinds of things. And really what that course is about is about teaching soft skills. It's about teaching the kind of soft skills that tend it's are quite hard to work into the geosciences courses normally, and it's hugely popular with students, mm -hmm. really popular. They get this, you know, whole concept of co-creation is right embedded in it. But we've also taken it one step further because we employed a, a student intern in the summer who took the resources that the students had created, went through all of them to clear the copyright, and then re-released them as open educational resources. So there's this whole kind of like virtuous circle, and, and it's the students doing it. Great, that's a super example. You know, I'm very excited to hear about that. And you know, that speaks to David Wiley's idea of no more throwaway assignments, right? Creating exactly. something that's useful to exactly. a community. A student is so much more motivated to do something yeah. like that rather than just write a paper that will never be seen by anyone again. Yeah, Jenny, I'll, I'll put a quick Sorry. plug in as well for uh, the We're Here uh, Know How project yes. that yeah. involved in this time this year. And I also did a student, so these are small scale projects with students curating and creating resources for language learning. Um, Great, and very exciting. A space, and we'd be delighted to connect with you there if that's um, of interest to you. Those are undergraduate students looking at Great. how they can right, the spectrum I need. Yeah. share their learning. Yeah. Something that we did was a book sprint. Oh, God, which, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. Is, uh -huh. yeah. Um, so, book sprints, you know, you have, they're, they're used to, Generate manuals, so mm -hmm. uh, floss use them quite often to, you know, get the community together to create the manual for an open uh, piece of software. And um, we were uh, all worked on the UK OER program. We wanted to create a summary of, of the program. So of, created, of the technical aspects yeah, of the program. Of the technical aspects. So we did a book sprint of uh, it was about four days, mm -hmm. and a, a around a table just working through what chapters you, we needed, started writing it. And I think that process was really interesting mm. in terms of, there's the co-creation in terms of the content overall that you want yeah. to create. There's the, then you go off individually to produce it, but there is still sharing, you know, you can immediately look across to someone on the other side of the table and say, was there something on yes, search yeah, engine yeah. optimization yeah, that we should uh -huh, include? Yeah. And so that was a really rich experience. And at the end of it, we had a book that's yeah. now on Amazon, yeah. 99p, yeah. and, uh -huh, uh -huh. available uh, for download as yeah. well. I mean, that was a really interesting experience. One, one thing that I think is important to say about that is it was facilitated. Yeah. And the role of the, I mean, the facilitator was amazing. It was facilitated by a guy called Adam Hyde, who, if you just look up book sprints, his, you know, his name is there. Um, and it, to keep everyone 
going and motivated and organized is a really important role there but it, it was very interesting because what we did was we we kind of flipped the way we normally work we talk a little bit flip classroom this was kind of flipped working because those of us who are involved in supporting that the UK VR program scattered all over the UK we're all used to working remotely anyway so it was you know just second nature to us but what we tended to do is occasionally we'd get together to have project meetings to talk and then we would go away and we would write stuff. And we kind of like turned that around. So what we did was we planned it all out in advance and then we came together and we did the writing in the same physical mm. space. And we all sat around a kitchen table for like four days and wrote. And every chapter we wrote got edited by two other people. So we were kind of passing our writing round. Yeah. Um, and it was, yeah, it was a really interesting process. I'd ha if you ever get a chance to try a book sprint or if you, you think it might sort of suit a project you're working on, I can highly recommend it. It's good. That sounds really interesting. I think it also gives people a lot of space before the actual meeting to interact and to look at the content and to think about it critically and deeply and then bring all of that into that um, synchronous meeting. Yeah. And I've had a couple of sessions that work that way, but we didn't actually meet face to face. I mean, Maha and I, we plan workshops all the time online and yeah. remotely and in the open as well. I mean, we either write about it on our blog or write on a Google Doc and get people's feedback about it. Uh, but uh, this time, um, this time that I'm referring to, it was with people that we, uh, we sort of decided to meet synchronously at this at the same time online but after having done all the work and then we were together there on a Google Doc working on everything mm -hmm. and also chatting uh, on Google Hangouts. Um, so it was um, it was pretty empowering. I mean, we were just on a roll, right? It was one hour of real concentrated focused work because everybody had really done their work and their research and was coming in with their own uh, their own stuff basically and their own uh, input and that sort of like put it all together in, in a beautiful beautiful uh, beautiful space. I really like I really like that idea, Lauren. I thank you for bringing it up. It's, yeah, it's, it's I mean I I was involved in an online book sprint as well, which I'll actually be mentioning a talk I'm doing tomorrow. It was. Um, Again, it was, it was Adam Hyde who invited me to take part in it, and it was actually a book sprint that was run face-to-face oh, yeah. -face and virtually to raise awareness of the disappearance of the Syrian Open Knowledge Activist, Basil Carterbill. Um, and what happened was there was a group phys physically located somewhere in France or Switzerland, yeah. I'm not even very sure where they were, and, but there was people all over the world writing for this book. Um, and over the course of five days, we produced this incredible piece of work called The Cost of Freedom, which is there to raise awareness of um, Basil's disappearance. And sadly, there's still no word on what happened to him. But that's one of the things I'll be talking about tomorrow, because I think that's a really good example of, of the power of openness, mm -hmm. really. That's amazing. I'm kind of aware that these folks, these folks probably need to, uh, you know, freshen up before the next round of what are you trying to say? Stop broadcasting, and um, I want to thank you. everybody for joining us, virtual folks, Graham, Jenny, Simon, Dina, who is join joining us uh, from Ghana, and Justin, who had to leave because his class was starting and the kids were coming in. Uh, thank you so much, Teresa, for bringing our on-site guests, uh, Lorna, Martin, and uh, John. And I'll see you guys uh, in the open and online uh, pretty soon. Thank you Bye so much. Bye. 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 Bye.